getting it started this morning. I want to say good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 12. <laughs> quickly look at what we looked at last week or uh, maybe it was a couple of weeks ago yeah a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, we're uh, still covering a series on rightly dividing uh, 2 Timothy 2:15. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, <coughs> you want to know a man, you want to be able to identify a man who uh, preaches but is not approved to God? Uh, show me a man that don't make divisions in God's word. Amen. And I'll show you a man that's not approved unto God. Uh, it's like I've uh, told uh, told people before, uh, God is a divider. Uh, anything that unifies or or tries to unify is satanic. Uh, in the very beginning, God divided the light from the darkness. Uh, he divided day from night. He divided man from woman. Uh, he divided uh, the nations. Uh, God divides, and uh, there's a reason for that, which I'm not going to go into this morning. Uh, but uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24, we've been looking. We looked last uh, the last time a couple weeks ago. We looked a couple weeks ago at. Uh, we started looking at a few weeks ago God's the difference in God's righteousness and personal righteousness. Uh, there is a difference in God's righteousness and personal righteousness in the scriptures. Uh, you can't find me anywhere in the Bible where a man had God's righteousness according to the law. Right. And Paul, Paul explained that to you why that is in Romans chapter 7. It's because the law is spiritual but he was carnal sold under sin. Uh, the law made uh, nothing perfect. Uh, the law could not justify men, but that doesn't mean they didn't have the standard of righteousness that God gave them according to the law. Right. Uh, and that's what we've been looking at, the difference in God's righteousness and personal righteousness. Uh, Paul said that according to the law, he was blameless, the same of uh, a uh, phrase he uses in reference to John the Baptist parents when it says that they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But Paul said that uh, he wanted to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which was of the law, but the righteousness of God. He wanted to have the righteousness of God, which was by faith, and be found in him, he said. He said, I want to be found in Jesus Christ, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God, which Amen. is my faith. Okay, and that's what we've been looking at. And a couple of weeks ago, we looked in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, you know, uh, people have a funny idea of the Bible. You will have men <laughs> that will live ungodly, live in the world, uh, not saved, and they'll get saved, and uh, four months later, they picked up a Bible, called themselves called to preach, and then they'll just start preaching what's according to the way they thought before they was ever even saved. Right. According to their own preconceived notions before they even had the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul one time disappeared for about 13 years to learn some of the things that he preached and what you have in your Bible. Right. And men think that they get saved because they cut out a few habits or they don't live like they used to live that all of a sudden they're qualified to preach. 
But the only thing that qualifies a man to preach is to have his way of thinking changed according to the Scriptures. And people have a funny idea. They think that this whole book right here is just a, a book on how men are born and they either are good enough to go to heaven or bad enough to go to hell. They think that's all that that book contains. Right there. So they just, they just end up believing in a general salvation that everybody that's ever going to be saved down through the ages is going to fall into the same category of people. And we looked a couple weeks ago in this chapter in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24, that there are different groups of not only beings, but there's different groups of men at this heavenly Jerusalem Paul's talking about here. Right. And he tells them, he says, We have not come, starting in verse 18, he says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mount, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Now that's the earthly experience that the children of Israel had after they come out of Egypt and come to the mountain. Okay? But then notice what he says. He says, you not come to that mountain. But in verse 22 he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. He's talking about a different mountain. There's two different mountains there. Do you understand that? He says, And an innumerable company of angels. There's an innumerable company of angels up there. You can't number them. They're innumerable. Okay? But there's also a general assembly. It's like I talked about two weeks ago. Let your mind go crazy for a minute. What does that include? It doesn't include the angels. Because he just distinguished them, the general assembly, from the angels that you can't even number. Okay? And it's a general assembly. It's just general. <laughs> It can include everything. Everything other than what he specifies here in these verses. I don't know what it has, what's included in that general assembly. I know that God's big. I, I know that uh, scientists don't have any clue how many stars there are. Amen. I want you to think about something for a minute. Something just came to me. You're talking about a God who when he created the heaven and the earth and he just he decided he decided, you know, one chapter in the Bible was sufficient to describe this entire universe. Okay? And he, then he gives you some specifics on one little star in that universe, planet Earth, and decides he's gonna tell you that he made man to have dominion over that star. But this universe is so big and all these stars that are innumerable, he gave it to you as a little side thought. He made the stars also. Yeah. Right. Like, oh yeah, I made the stars also, but I'm not interested in telling you about that. Yeah. Now think about the general assembly. Man. <laughs> I don't know. And the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, notice this, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Notice those different groups of people there. First you got the church of the firstborn, and you got the spirits of just men made perfect. Are they the same? If they were, why did he tell you about both of them if they're the same? Now, verses, uh, let's see, go to 
Revelation 7, I'm going to look at these real fast because I want to finish with this today. Revelation 7. We're speaking about personal righteousness. That's why people, when they get over to James chapter 2, even men that even men that claim to know how to rightly divide, you'll show them the contradiction in James chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3, and they still want to ignore like it isn't there. Right. Amen. Now you either got to explain that in the correct Holy Spirit-guided way, or it's a contradiction. Right. James said in James chapter 2, verse 24, he said, You see then how the man is justified by works and not faith only. Right. Paul said in Romans 3, 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Right. And even men that are rightly divided will get over there and say, Well, what James is saying is that if a person says he has faith... James is talking about a man's personal righteousness. Right. Listen, Amen. when I get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes me into the body of Christ. I become one with Him. I'm baptized into His body. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that if we're baptized into His body, we're baptized into His death and into His resurrection. Amen. Amen. And then Paul went on to tell you, he said... Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Amen. That's the faith that Paul's talked about in Romans 3.28 that we're justified by. And it's that faith alone that justifies Amen. man. But once I'm dead, buried, and resurrected in Christ and I'm justified eternally by his faith, I still got to walk through this life and I still got to exercise my own faith. Amen. And then if I tell you while I'm walking in this life that I believe if I touch this board right here, it'll kill me, and then I walk over here and touch it, that's dead faith. Amen. <laughs> Revelation 7, verse 11. All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are those, these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he, he said to me, these are they, these are they which came out of great tribulation. Right. Now you got men that will even tell you that the church is not going to go through the great tribulation because it's a time of Jacob's trouble. Amen. But then they get over here and read this and fail to recognize it's not the same as the church. Amen. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I ain't washed my robe. When I got saved, I got His robe. Amen. Right. Right. I'm one with Him. Do you not understand that? Do you not understand that when the Bible says we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone, that we are Jesus Christ? Amen. Members of His body. But these are they which wash their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. They've come through great tribulation. They had their robes. They had to endure to the end. They had to be watching. They had to refuse the mark. They had to wash their robes. Right. In Revelation 12, verse 17,
And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who's that? Israel. That's the Jews. And what's their testimony? They keep the commandments of God and, and, and Amen. have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith plus works. James 2.24. Right. Amen. Revelation 15. Verses 1 to 3. Listen, I'm not an expert on the book of Revelation. It don't take a rocket scientist to go through this book and realize that there's different groups of people. Right. There's one group over here. We may look at it here a little bit. I'm not really sure if I got it in my notes. There's one group over here in Revelation. We may get to it in a second. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. How long has that song been around? Been around since Moses. Right. But guess what? That's not the same as the people over there. It's of every kindred, tongue, nation, and people that sing a new song. Right. right. <clears throat> if it's been around since Moses, it's not new. <laughs> That's why we call it the Old Testament. Yeah. Amen. Revelation 15, 1 to 3, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and, and, and the song of the Lamb. Saying, Great marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. <clears throat> they had the song of Moses and the servant of uh, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Then back in Revelation 5, verse 9, we see the difference. I jumped a little ahead of myself, didn't I? Here's a group of people, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What's their song? Their song ain't about uh, keeping the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Their song is about being redeemed. Amen. Plain and simple, that's all they say. Yeah. Look at Galatians chapter 4. <laughs> Moses, the servant of God, is what one group of them sung. Paul says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all but as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem, 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 what was the song, the new song? Thou hast redeemed us. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of of sons. Now notice this. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. How do we receive that Spirit? We've said that so many times here in this church in the last two years. Everybody should be able to tell me how we receive the Spirit. Living in death, burial, and resurrection. Who else knew that? If you can't raise your hand, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> I mean, seriously. You can't tell me how you receive the Spirit of God and you go to sleep at night and don't worry about nothing. And that's the... Uh, 
the plain evidence of salvation is that you have the Spirit. That's the only sign God has given to us. Right. In this generation we live in is that we have His Spirit. This church, these churches running around wanting to see stuff all the time don't have a clue what they're talking about. Right. This church right down the road had a revival. The sign outside said, come and see, come and see, come and see. Paul told us we walk by faith, not by sight. Right. We walk by faith. The only sign God has given us is the sign of His Spirit living in us. You need Amen. to know how you get that Spirit. That's the only thing that ever gave me assurance of my salvation is when I finally understood because God got tired of me uh, wrestling around with him at night and in my mind. <laughs> What's that remind you of? Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> I'd wrestle with him. Lord, oh, please help me. Please help me. I want to make sure I'm saved. I don't know if I'm for sure if I'm saved. Did I believe hard enough, Lord? Did I believe right? <laughs> Did I have the right kind of faith or uh, enough faith? Some people say this. James, Book of James says that. Romans says this. He finally told me how to know I was saved. Because I got his spirit. How did I know that I got a spirit? Because you ain't going to find anywhere in the Bible that says you receive that spirit for a New Testament church. Somebody living, that's a Gentile living in this age, other. The Apostle Paul never told you to receive that spirit any other way but believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. That's right. Amen. The gospel of your salvation. But here in Galatians 4, 4 again, <coughs> because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Notice, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. So can the song of Moses, the servant of God, apply to us? If we're no longer a servant, but a son. How are we no more a son and not a servant? Because we have the Spirit of God. That's what he just said. Right. Because of your sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son in your hearts. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. So, those people over in Revelation that sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, is not the church. They have personal righteousness. We have God's righteousness. Right. God's righteousness is imputed. It's not earned by walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord and being blameless. It's imputed. God's righteousness. Imputed. Personal righteousness. For those of you watching on video, if you don't disagree with that, go back and watch the first two parts on God's righteousness and personal righteousness. If you're using the internet, I know you know how to go back and find those other two parts to this series. <coughs> Personal righteousness was gained by walking in all the commandments and ordinances of God. You were blameless. Stop making all that equal, justified,
were not guilty. The word blameless does not equal justified. That's why it's big, but that's people's biggest problem when you have Bible conversations with, with them is they think that you can just interchange words. That when I say enemy, I mean hate. Or when I say blameless, I mean justified. God said blameless because he meant blameless. He didn't use the word justified. Right. Because he didn't mean justified. That's the greatest lesson I ever learned from one of my favorite preachers is that you got to let God say what he said and Amen. mean what he means. Amen. They want to take a verse where it says, Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. So you come over here and say, Well, John the Baptist's parents had their own personal righteousness because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the God and were blameless. And they say, No, no, no. Because the Bible says, By the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Well, I didn't say over here they were justified. Right. So the verse you're using is pointless. That's how they discuss the Bible. We're simply talking about righteousness. We're not talking about being justified. Romans 4, 1 to 7, we talk about the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Blessed is the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works. What about the man that gets righteousness by works? He's not blessed. We're blessed. Amen. Romans 4, 19-24 Paul tells you that when we believe, God imputes <coughs> righteousness to us. His righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 3. But now, but now, but now, when everybody in harmony, now, now, what does that mean, I wonder? <laughs> now. When Paul wrote it, did it mean yesterday? Huh? No. No. If you go back and read the rest of Romans chapter 3, Paul talks about all being guilty before God. And then he says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Righteousness of God without the law must not have been manifested before this. Right. Amen. Right? Right. So he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by who? The law and the prophets. Right. They witnessed it. They did not manifest it. They witnessed it. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, knows that, not in Jesus Christ, it's not the righteousness of God which is by faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, God means what he says. Says what he means. If he meant faith in Jesus Christ, he'd have said faith in Jesus Christ. But he said, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Gospel John chapter 3. <laughs> I need to start getting here earlier, don't I? Yeah. Amen. I 
I'll tell you right now, I'm the worst procrastinator in the world. Yeah, amen. If I need 20 minutes to get over here from my house, I'll leave at 19 to you. That's just the way I am. I put everything off the last minute, and then when these little things that hold you up sneak in, I'm two or three minutes late. Or 10. Or 10. <laughs> or 10, that's right. John chapter 3. Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. <laughs> Who's that? Jesus Christ. And who? The bride. The that's Jesus Christ and the church. Am I wrong? And Paul said, John's telling you, John the Baptist, who Jesus said there was no greater prophet born of one <laughs> than John the Baptist, is telling you right there that he's not the bride or the bridegroom. Right. Wow, that's a pretty important distinction if you ask me. Yeah. He says, Ye yourselves bear me witness, and I said, I'm not the Christ, but I'm sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Let's write that on the board for those of you at home. John the Baptist. friend of bridegroom. The bride is Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. The bridegroom is Jesus Christ. The church is the bride. better figure that out. They're not the same. John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. This cause shall man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But notice this. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ and the church. How do I know that the friend of the bridegroom and the bride can't be the same? Because Paul just told you in Ephesians that Jesus Christ in the church is one flesh. So if John distinguished himself from Jesus Christ, you best believe he was distinguishing himself from you. Right. Things different are not the same. Revelation 19. We'll be closing here in just a second. Revelation 19, verses 6 to 8. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted, 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 that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. 
I believe every saint that's in heaven, Old Testament, New Testament, or whatever, will be arrayed in fine linen. I believe some some of them will be arrayed in linen that they've washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's their own robes. I believe the church is granted and given a garment made of fine linen, clean and white. Notice here that she doesn't wash her robes. <coughs> it's granted to her. Amen. They're not the same. If somebody comes to a wedding and they walk in in a bunch of filthy rags, you say, well, I'd rather you not uh, be in my wedding dressed like that. Uh, this person here that's in the wedding brought their own dress. This person that's in the wedding brought their own dress. This person that's in the wedding brought their own dress. You say, well, I don't have any other dress. Well, here, I got one for you to wear. That's not the same as the people that had their own dress. One second, we'll be done here. Romans 3, 20 to 28. We looked at this a second ago. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works, nay, by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Right. Real fast, and then I'll close. I've never said one time this morning that an Old Testament saint or any of those people over there in Revelation were not justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Back here in the Old Testament, you had a law given to Moses And from there to Jesus Christ, any man that kept that law when he died he went into Abraham's bosom. Why? He had a standard of righteousness that God gave. It was according to this. Right. But he was not justified. He could not appear before God. Why? Because by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So when these men kept the law, they had that standard of righteousness that God gave under the Old Testament. 
when they died, they went into Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus Christ came and died and resurrected, when he resurrected, they resurrected and appeared before God with him. Amen. And then here's you and I out here being justified by faith. And when the Bible says there in Romans 3, look at that verse again. Whom God hath set forth, forth to be a propitiation, verse 25, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. When men sinned back here, they offered sacrifice. Then they sinned, they offered sacrifice. Then they sinned, they offered sacrifice. Then they sinned, they offered sacrifice. And they offered sacrifice day after day after day after day. And what was God doing? Jesus Christ was set forth as a propitiation to declare God's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. These were all past sins of the time that Jesus Christ would die. All right. And what Paul's telling you is that Jesus Christ was set forth as a propitiation to declare God's righteousness for remitting those sins. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, the Bible tells us, but God had Jesus Christ set forth and he was sitting there and he was through his forbearance, that verse tells you, or his long suffering or patience to make it more <coughs> understandable to you, God let that stuff go. Remission, 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 remission. Why? Because he was looking at that. Right. You never one time heard me say in this sermon, for those of you at home that's going to nitpick it to death, that a man can have his sins taken away by anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I never one time said that. We've been talking about righteousness and justification. All right. Stop making terms the same. Next week we'll look, well, the week after that, maybe, Either next week, go ahead and turn it off. Either next week.